My courses were 250, and I had to develop a technique to persuade them that there weren't 250 people in the room. And so I, I, I can remember the very day where I came to the conclusion of how I could do that. And I was lecturing about ancient astronomy, and the student in the very front row of Moore 116 said, why, why do we have to know anything about the ancient Greeks? They're dead, and they were not as smart as we are, and we know the truth. And it, I just flared with anger since I just finished <laughs> working a long time on a ancient Greek thought, and they were my friends. And so I, I immediately said, well, then tomorrow bring f one observation that the Earth is round and one observation that it moves. It rotates and it revolves, so bring two. Bring three observations. So the next day they came with their observations, and because of my work in medieval astronomy, I could destroy each of their arguments and at that time, we didn't tell them the Earth moved until midterm. But what they were forced to do then was think through what their misconceptions were. So the rest of the time I taught those courses, I worked on developing ways to show them what they thought was true and believed it to be true, had to be shown by argument to be false before they could accept that light is a wave, or that it's a particle, or it's both, mm -hmm. which is ultimately one of the great <laughs> ideas of the 20th century. Yeah. Keeping with the concept of, of community, but uh, moving to a different set of students. And I've forgotten the, the exact year. Uh, Probably late 80s, very late 80s, 89 or yeah, 90. Yeah, Hanley, Hanley, it was Hanley Funderburk was president, and and uh, Bonnie Gray, two consecutive student, faculty regents, Bonnie Gray and then Richard Freed, uh, you know, lobbied uh, vigorously uh, for the creation of an honors program. And I don't know what year it actually got got started. Uh, but you, were engaged, the, but you were engaged ladies. in the honors program as a There was as a, a committee prior to that of deans, and I, for some reason, got the the job of acting associate dean of the College of Arts and S no, no of Arts and Humanities. What did we? We had three colleges: science and mathematics, natural mathematical sciences, yeah. social and behavioral sciences. And so in the summertime, I had to humanities. meet with all the other deans, and we they were crafting how an honors program could have a curriculum that linked to the general education program. So I was on that committee, and then when Bonnie was made chair, the deans had set up that skeleton, but the courses themselves had to be designed. And we got a series of about four grants, maybe five. And we met every summer from th three weeks to six weeks, depending on the grant and brought in outside experts were in areas where we thought we were weak as a team. And so I was working both with the scientists and with the historians. Uh, so I had some impact on both, I suppose. And, but the, the, that community bonded mostly after a huge fight between an English professor and a historian as to whether literature or history should dominate the other. And after lunch, we finally decided that they could be equal. Um, and so all of the uh, anger had dissipated by over lunch. And it, when we got that, we started creating common blocks. And we, we developed a system that has lasted pretty much intact for since the early 90s anyway. Of course, of course, we could talk about this for a long time, but back, but, but back to that point. Um, as a historian, but as a historian whose focus is 
on history as humanity as opposed to, yeah. to social science, I would say that a large part of the distinction between what's literature and what's history is a difference without a distinction. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, So that the schooling of the mind to think critically requires a fairly broad sweep of ideas to liberate yourself in a sense. So yeah. I've always seen my job as liberating the myth that students were taught, whether it be history or mm -hmm. science, that gave them comfort. But I mean, the, one of the scariest projects I worked on was that they wanted to see on one of Einstein's anniversaries whether third graders and seniors in high school would write differently about Einstein. And I was hired to read the typescripts, so I couldn't tell by the writing style or writing uh, technique. And I was supposed to separate them into third graders and high school students. And the, the, the absolute scariest thing that happened to me was there was absolutely no difference because no one ever taught Einstein yeah. in any form whatsoever. T and, and, to, and so the, one of the problems is how do you do modern ideas in a general education course if part of the goal is get, they didn't even know he had get bad the hair, grounding? Huh? They didn't even know he had no. bad hair. Well, no, they uh, all know E equals but, MC squared, but they have no idea what they're talking but, but about. This is, this is getting a little far afield because I want to come back to that, the success yeah. story that the honors program's been, but you, uh, your colleague, was it D Dwayne Hard Harding? Dwayne Hard Harding. Yeah. Dwayne, D Dwayne Harding, who left us to be a weatherman out in the, on the Atlantic coast, Virginia, yeah, Virginia or somewhere yeah. in there. Uh, you know, I, I remember he had this rubber mask uh, of Einstein that yes, when he, he was talking about Einstein's work to his science classes. He was a remarkable he, teacher. He, he was, was a very good weatherman yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. Was, made more money as well, a Well, he started out doing part weather part-time for one of the Lexington yeah. stations. But back to, back Brian to the... Brian Collins trained him. That's right. But back to the, uh, back to the honors program and uh, not a lot of folks, including some I would, I would, I would hasten to add on this campus uh, have a full appreciation of just how successful uh, and sometimes on a shoestring oh, yeah. uh, our honors program has been the, uh, the, the, the size of it the, the enriching uh, impact both for other students uh, but particularly, and this also benefits other students, although somewhat directly, indirectly, the opportunity that faculty members have to be pushed. You know, we, we, we think a lot about faculty members pushing students, but equally as powerful is, is what happens when students push faculty members. And I think that's a, I think that's, has that not been a component of the honors program, Bruce? Yeah, I, I think certainly with the people I worked with, uh, and I work, I probably team taught most of my career, and I've probably team taught with over 30 people. And so when you're team teaching, there is a way to watch the students responding to the other teacher, and you watch that teacher while they're talking in order to toss it from one to the other and to the student. And in the honors program, the luxury of having 20 to 25 students in a room, if you have the right room, you could do 25, but it's, it, with the rooms we have, it would be better less than 25. Then you can get almost every student to speak at least once in, in, in the one class period. And there are some students who come who you can tell by looking they're extraordinarily shy. And so you have to ask questions that are terribly self-evident. There are others who are extremely arrogant. And so you can ask them anything <laughs> that gives them a challenge. And yeah, we, we worked very hard at keeping students active in the classroom and so we weren't, uh, with, with David Sefton, whom I worked with longest, I suppose, we finally concluded we were too, too dominant if we stood up or if we went to the blackboard. Because if we went to the blackboard, they'd start writing down what we wrote. So we sat across from one another 
And we both could then work one half of the room easily and could we, we got to know the names of all of the students. And we could get them to play with us, basically. I mean, I, I call it play. I, I think what we were doing was ultimately showing them that they could defend a proposition if, if they had done their reading. They could support a claim of truth if, if they used the evidence they had. And so it was, it, it was it's an absolutely delightful way to teach. But I think, you know, I, I'm convinced that the existence and especially the way our honors program has functioned, uh, has enriched the educational experience here for a lot of people beyond those uh, in, in the honors program. One thing in particular, uh, as, as, as faculty learn more what students are capable of, uh, I think our whole emphasis in the expansion of undergraduate research on this campus oh, that's amazing. has been, has, but has been fed by you know, the first of that that was done in a big way uh, was the thesis, the thesis yeah, requirement uh, to be an honor to be an honor scholar. And the, the and other, I, but I think, but I think that's infused itself beyond yeah, just the honors program. Th that's, I think that may be true. But I think also the thing that I find absolutely well, I, I lived it with the students because I came here and when I was 25, and I had not been anywhere for the most part. So when Bonnie started these trips, these cultural trips, and the trips to major, uh, the national conferences, and then we could have students prepare presentations, and that gave them the sense they could independently create a, a meaningful thing about what they were doing. And so I think all of that ties together, but the, watching the students go to Washington, D.C. or to uh, Denver, Colorado, the, the, or Salt Lake, they, they see something they've never seen before, and I was in the same boat. And so I keep going on the trips if I can get on the, one of my panels accepted, because I like seeing it through their eyes each time. It's as if I am still, uh, for the first time, looking at it. You mentioned the, uh, the, the conference, and uh, of course it's one of the things about which we're very proud is that uh, EKU honor students uh, typically outnumber the students from any other single mm -hmm. institution uh, yeah, in I, terms of being invited to make presentations at the National Honors Conference. I, I think if, if there was only one thing you could do is to keep that kind of travel, particularly for our, our, our students. Uh, the other thing I found our students now much more willing to do than when I first started is to go abroad. That, I mean, that, that movement has picked up in the last 10 years, let's mm -hmm. say, uh, and, dramatically. And that's, a, and that's, a, that's incredibly uh, important, especially for many of the students who come to us from, our, from yeah. southeastern Kentucky who, uh, hey, listen, we have folks come here who, not many, but some, that when they come to Eastern, that's their first real excursion out of their out of their home county. I share that with them because I, I never left Austin, Minnesota until I went to Decor, Iowa. Yeah, okay. So I mean, there's, a, or if I went anywhere, it all looked the same. So it, it, there was nothing novel in it. 